Welcome to the Blue Collar Blueprint Podcast. Today we have guest Nate Bowman. Nate is a professional welder and originally from North Carolina. He went to school up in upstate New York and now lives in Vancouver, Washington. Nate has been in the welding industry for about 17 years. He also runs heavy equipment professionally, does professional photography, is a producer, is a hobbyist of cars and sound systems. So dive on in. Me and Nate go over some very, very important, crucial things, steps to help younger individuals get into the skilled trades and some cool benefits about it like cars, for example, and other awesome opportunities that exist, especially in the welding industry. If you really want to get into the welding industry, check this episode out because Nate goes over some very important key aspects to know, to learn how to get started in the welding industry. Jump on in and I hope you enjoy it. All right, here we're today we're with Nate, and Nate is a welder originally from North Carolina, is it? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in uh, just outside of Charlotte. So, Nate, I just want to hop right into it. So, you're a welder, correct? So, how did you get started in the welding, you know, trade? For us, for a lot of us, we got started in the trades because our parents are blue collar, we grew up in the country, or, you know, maybe we had shop class in high school. And we just enjoyed it. So that's what we got into. How did you get started in it? Um, you know, when I was like kind of in that age that, you know, 12, 10, 11, 12, 13, like kind of where you're starting to try and figure out like what path you want to go in uh, school. Um, that was the same time that shows like Mythbusters and Monster Garage and that kind of stuff was coming out uh, on Discovery Channel. So um, I was watching like Junkyard Wars, yeah, Mythbusters, um, like the West Coast Chopper show. Um, you know, Jesse James was was a you know big into that in that uh, like welding space. So it, um, I grew up you know doing construction. Like my dad was a carpenter and stuff, so I grew up you know swinging a hammer. Um, you know, always in a tool belt working on projects. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something different, and welding just was definitely like what I wanted. I would just, this is what I want to do. And fortunately for me, I knew early. Um, so I just kind of set myself up, you know, a path for that. And, uh, one of those things was taking a high school welding class. Um, so I took all the like, you know, STEM or CTE classes, that kind of stuff, the science technology type classes that I could possibly take in school. And, um, I, I went to like a trade school for half of the day um, and got bossed to a trade school for half a day um, my senior year. And, um, you know, just kind of uh, after that, I went went in the Air Force for metal fabrication. And uh, when I got out of the service, uh, did a little bit of like work in retail and just kind of uh, put the tool belt back on and, and did more construction work until I could get into another welding school. Um, and then did a six month, uh, full-time welding program at, a at a school in upstate New York and, um, just jumped right into the workforce from there. So worked at a place for a while and just kept moving up. So you go to a welding school, in your opinion, would you suggest, obviously like we had a, we had a welding class at our high school too. I mean, it was just a shop class, of course, you know, you just welded it and my dad and uncles and stuff welded too, just home projects and whatnot. But would you recommend or do you think it's basically a requirement to go to a welding school and, I mean, you get some sort of certifications? How does that really work and, you know, going to the school and then how it propels you into a career in the welding industry? I think, um, you know, anybody that's in any sort of welding program, whether it's a, you know, a 10-week program, a 10-month program, um, you know, a... Uh, a community college welding program, you know, a weekend introduction to welding class, anything like that, to me, that is a great talking point um, for a potential employer. Um, you know, we hear all the time, like how much there's a need for blue collar workers and how much uh, a need we have for uh, welders in particular. Um, and I suggest this to students that I visit when I go do trainings at schools all the time. It's like, just get in your car and drive to a place that you potentially want to work and ask them, hey, you know, what does it take to get in the door here? Um, you know, I'm looking for work. I'm taking a high school welding program right now. 
um, you know, what kind of stuff do you guys weld on? Um, and, you know, the entry point in the industry does not need to be as steep as I think people make it out to be. I think that just going and knocking on the door and, uh, and, 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 and showing that, that potential employer that, Hey, I've, I've taken the initiative to, uh, take this welding program again, doesn't need to be a serious, really long in-depth welding program. Those are great. Um, but I found, especially like as my career has gone on, like those programs are actually really helpful after you've been welding for a little bit of time. So you can go back and work on building like some skills and things like that. But I mean, as far as just getting into the industry, I mean, it doesn't matter how long your welding school is. As soon as you go out into, I mean, no matter whether it's welding or plumbing or electrical or HVAC or whatever, as soon as you get into the job, the actual real job, it's you learn more probably the first week than you do in that entire six month or, you know, year long program or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say anybody that's thinking about getting into the industry, if you have aptitude, if you've welded in your garage with a welder or at your uncle's house on his welder, uh, just try knocking on the door. Like it doesn't have to be a big ordeal to get into the industry. So, yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love to hear that because uh, I think more so now with, you know, in the last five years or so trade schools have been a, a bigger thing. People re are thinking like, I go to, have to go to a trade school. I have to go to this, to your schooling to get into a trade and it's like yeah if you, if you want to you can but just like you're saying go knock on doors that's what i've been hearing a lot too from like these hvac companies because I'm, I'm in phoenix area so there's a ton of hvac companies and they need like guys the thing is they have their own system so even if you work let's say a welding at a welding company for five years and you get a job at a different welding company when you enter that door to that new welding company, they're going to have systems that they want to teach you that they how they want things done, correct? So, so that's like a common thing I've been seeing lately is that no matter what the experience, like cool, you have experience and hopefully, you know, that experience is helpful, but we're still going to teach you how we want things to get done at our company. You, you, you see that? Totally see that. And, you know, there's a lot of companies now that are doing, you know, their own types of training, like in-house training and that kind of thing, just because the need is so great. Um, and I'm definitely, I mean, I'm a, in, I'm a huge, huge advocate for welding education and, and, and educating yourself because the smarter you are, no matter what industry you're in, uh, the further you're going to go. Um, but you know, a lot of people, will will just be like well i i just can't dedicate two years or six months or uh 10 months or whatever to uh to this program um i need to go right to work right away and you know if you just show up and you ask i mean maybe you're sweeping the floor four days a week and you're welding one day a week maybe you're um you just start out grinding or tacking parts together or whatever um, until you can build out this core group of skills that you need to learn, um, you know, in order to do the job kind of all on your own. So, um, yeah, I would encourage people just get in your car, drive to a place that you think that you might want to work, vibe check the place, see if it's a place that you might want to work and, um, you know, just get your foot in the door. Yeah, exactly. Like this HVAC company we're working with right now to build a course on basically become an HVAC tech in the HVAC industry. Um, the owner, he was saying that exact same thing. He's uh, he's look, he's gonna be looking for an employee to be just be like a shop boy, essentially, just you know, going through material, just organizing things, getting jobs ready. And he was like, "Well, yeah, I mean, we, it, I'd love to, I'd love to get a kid right out of high school, come, come work, come work, come work in the garage for a little bit, and we see if you have initiative. You know, you can work, you can figure things out, put one and two together, and then as time moves on." Move them into hopping one of their HVAC techs, go out on a job, see what it's like out on the job, you know, here and there where there's free time so he can learn. And it's like, okay, well, that's massive because now that kid is getting experience and seeing what it's like to be an HVAC tech in real life. And he's not seeing this perceived thing, you know, if you go to school, become an HVAC tech and spending that money and that time. Yeah. 
and you're get and you're, yeah and you're getting paid for your time like as a as a 18 19 year old kid you're getting paid right away uh you know like that's you know there's a there's a lot to that i mean if you go to a school uh when i was in welding school i um you know i was working at night at a hotel i mean i was 37 and a half or 37 38 classroom hours a week not including lunch and not including like drive time and all that stuff so it was like 40 hours a week i was in school but i was also working at a hotel 40 50 hours a week at night and it was brutal it sucked but had i you know like going back and looking at that had i spent let's say two or three weeks out actively looking very dip, you know, diligently for a job, I probably could have landed a welding job with the amount of experience that I had prior to even going to the welding school. Um, the welding schools are great. I think that they're really good. It really gives you a lot of time to uh, spend under the hood and, and practice and kind of hone your skills. But at the same time, um, you know, there's really no replacement for on the job training. And, um, you mentioned like people showing an initiative. I, uh, I work with a company that manufactures trailers here in, uh, in Portland, just outside of Portland here. And, um, the owner of that company actually brought this up to me and says, Hey, you know, we get a lot of applicants and they might not do so great on the weld test, but they got a great attitude. Um, and then vice versa they could have a horrible attitude and kill the weld test. And they're like, yeah, we just don't want to hire this person just because of how they act. So um, I would say like my message to people is don't worry so much about how perfect your welding skills are or whatever. Like if you care and you want to put the work in, like people will help you along the way. Um, and especially if you start out that way, just saying, hey, man, like, I'm just learning. I want to learn. I want to start from the bottom and work my way up. I might not be the greatest welder. I don't have a ton of experience, but that's how you get it um, by showing up. Yeah, that, that's that's key information. Like, I love to hear hear that because uh, I try to preach it myself to, to other people who have questions for me, especially with Blueprint, where it's like, I mean, you, you, you preached it perfectly. So I'm going to reel it into... Uh, so you go through welding school and then you get out on the job. What kind of welding, what, what kind of jobs are you doing? Are you doing like custom fabrications? Are you out on the job like welding equipment? Like I know there's a lot of avenues you can go down welding. So My, my career has kind of been, um, you know, pretty diverse. I started in, um, when I was 21, I started my own just kind of small welding company, just doing on-site repair work. I mean, anything from fixing like old ladies' gates and broken lawnmowers to, um, you know, building custom handrails and, you know, gate, you know, whatever. I did a lot of gates and things like everybody always needs that kind of stuff done. Um, so I, I did that. But uh, my first job, I was welding a, a lot of stainless steel Um for this company that built giant industrial washing machines. So, you know, very diverse amount of, you know, just fabrication, not necessarily like I didn't have to do a ton of the fabrication, but fitting parts up and making sure that things were precise. Um, I moved on to another company that did uh, pH adjustment systems. So I did stainless steel piping and then fabricated all the skids for them. Um, I ended up getting into welding education, uh, after I worked for another company after that. So I was a welding instructor for a high school welding program, actually the same one that I, I took when I was in high school, my instructor retired and I took his position, worked there for two years, um, before I moved across the country. Now I live in, uh, Vancouver, Washington. So it's just, just outside of Portland. And, um, very familiar with that area. I'm from, I grew up and I'm from Longview. And yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm like just, yeah. Yeah. Right down the street. So, um, yeah, I worked for, um, worked for a, a major gas distributor for a while as a kind of a, in like a problem solving role, like a technical role. Um, and that's where I got my certified welding inspector, like became a weld inspector, uh, certified welding educator, certified welding supervisor. Um, so my role has kind of shifted from being the day-to-day -day welder into doing more welding R&D, uh, product development, testing, procedure development, inspection, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so that's, that's really most of what I do now. My current role, like full-time job is uh, I'm the director of welding optimization and education for Central Welding Supply. So it's a very large regional welding supply company. And um, I solve problems for our customers and um, kind of help accelerate the careers of uh, my coworkers and stuff that want to do uh, more of the technical uh, problem solving type welding stuff, which is uh, really, really needed in the industry. Um, people that can, you know, throw a hood and jacket and gloves on and go out and weld with our customers and, and go figure out how to get them uh, to where they need to be. So that's a huge part of, uh, of what I do. And then uh, I own a company now called Weld Science, um, and I travel around the country doing uh, welding educational classes and trainings and consulting for uh, businesses and schools. I'm on advisory boards all across the country for, for different schools to, to kind of help connect the dots between what we need in the industry and what educators should be teaching, um, as well as like creating my own training programs and things like that as well. So um, I do a lot in the industry. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome to hear because uh, just just what you're talking about is the the sheer fact of you start it you start in a trade. Let's say you know you start at the bottom and you work your way up to, but then it, once you get to a level like for me as a journeyman lineman level, you go through you start as a groundman, you go through an apprenticeship, you become a journeyman lineman. That may take you know four years, six years, ten years to get to that point. But I mean, once you get become a journeyman, then it like opens up so many new avenues on where to go. Just like you're seeing with your time and experience in the welding industry, it's opened up doors to go different different routes. You know what I mean? Like you're not you're not maybe you are, but from the sounds of it, you're not in the field making beads right now. Nope, nope. Like I will, yeah, I still weld. Probably, I would say maybe like once or twice a week now. Like. But I definitely like through and through I work in the welding industry. And there's I think that for a lot of people, they feel that like, well, I don't want to become a welder because I don't want to be stuck out in the shop working 60 hours a week in a cold, dark shop. I don't want that either. Um, but you don't have to do that. You know, um, you don't have to. The, the industry is really big. And once you put your time in and you gain some expertise you know, you can go into consulting, you can go into education, you can go into, you know, and that old adage, you know, those who can't do, they teach. And it's like, yeah, you know, for some people, but like, there's some really, like, huge need for really good educators and, and people that can teach um, just because, because of that whole, the reason why that stereotype is true. Like, there's a bunch of educators that have uh, left the industry and have I've been teaching for 10 or 15 years and they're just not really quite in tune with what's going on today. Um, but because of my, my day job, you know, going out and solving problems like on the regular in front of, you know, customers, like I'm welding with customers that are welding in today, now, like 2023, um, and, and figuring out what, what challenges they have and, and, using the modern equipment and using all that stuff. So, I mean, I'm very in tune with what's happening. Um, and then that, you know, you can take that knowledge and then use it in your consulting role or use it in a class that you're teaching or something like that. So it's, um, you know, really just stems from this core, you know, group of skills. And it just like, like you said, coming into the industry and you could be sweeping the floor and welding one day a week. And then, you know, I'm 35 now. So let's say, you know, 15, 20 years, you can basically be doing what you want to be doing. I mean, that's it. And I started in a regular high school welding program, like just like any other shop class kid or, or whatever. So, I mean, if I can do it, like anybody can can make this make this happen. It's kind of funny you say that because uh, like. I didn't do any welding. I, I really loved welding because to me, I felt like it's kind of like an art form. Like you're on a weld, like put down and slap down a really good beads. Like I, I, I really liked it. But so when I graduated high school, like I, I knew I wanted to become a lineman. I just didn't know at what point, you know, like when I was going to get, go through the whole thing. So we're right out of high school. I ended up getting a job at a local, basically fab shop. They do a lot of like, 
CNC and stuff or industrial long views of mill town, right? So they do, they do a lot of work for the mills, uh, fabrication, whatever the mills need, just a, a bunch of stuff. Well, what I did there was customers would come in like, oh, hey, I need, uh, can I get five chunks of angle iron, you know, three feet long, the two by two. I was like, yeah, sure. So I cut them five pieces. Like, you know what I mean? I, they, they'd want the steel to order it and I cut it and I give it to them, sell it to them. And then uh, if I would have stuck with it, I know for a fact, for a fact, I would have gone into their, I would have been able to work my way into their fabrication area, basically start welding, start learning about the more technical side of the, the company. For a fact, I know if I wanted to, if I really wanted to, but it just, it for me, it just wasn't much of an interest to do it. So, but I'm just saying like I had no no knowledge, no degree, no nothing to get a job. Like that's just very basic level entry things. And then you know where you know where Gunderson's is? Yeah, so uh two of my brothers and three of my cousins and two of my brothers, same exact thing. They're like, oh hey, yeah, we love welding. Let's get a job welding. So they saw that Gunderson's was hiring. Gunderson's was looking for welders, right? So they're just like, ah oh, shoot. So they applied for it. They walked in, did a couple welding tests, and like, oh, you guys are pretty good at welding. Hired on the spot. And it's like, they didn't have no college. They have no, not college, they didn't have no degree in no welding school experience. They walked in, they did the test. They're like, oh, yeah, you guys are pretty good at welding. You know, you could maybe use some help here, but we'll teach you. We'll train you. We'll teach you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what it is or why people feel that it's so out of reach, like, or, or that they've got to, they, they feel that they have to do this. I mean, that's a huge misnomer, uh, in the industry. A lot of people think that like, well, don't you need to be certified to be a welder? And it's like, well, yeah, if you're welding on stuff that requires certification and nine times out of 10, those, you know, if you're working for a company, they're going to hold those, those credentials, they're going to test you, they're going to pay for that. Um, so like going out and getting your own, uh, you know, it's not really necessary. I mean, if it's something that interests you and you have aptitude from like another industry, I mean, like as a lineman or as a carpenter or, um, you know, a plumber, HVAC guy, I mean, like you have a core group of skills, like you can, you can read a tape measure, uh, you know, you can, you know, there's a lot of the similar problem solving type stuff. Uh, that takes place in, um, you know, in the welding industry. And I think that, um, you know, anybody that has that type of skills, a mechanic or, or anything like that, could jump into the welding space and, and do just fine. Um, and especially nowadays, like the younger, I call them kids, not not necessarily like I'm, I'm only 35, but like, you know, the, the, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, like, you know, coming right out of high school, um, you know, welding equipment and, and in a lot of the industry has gotten a lot more technical. Um, welders have screens on them now. Um, I mean, we have uh, cobots that have uh, tablets and stuff that you program all the welding in and you're not welding anything. You're just programming the machine to do the welding. Um, so you don't really need very much welding experience at all. But like if you can interact with a tablet and you understand that kind of stuff, which younger people have a, just an easier time than me, even being 35, like, you know, you give a 17 or 18 year old a tablet and they're like, yeah, I got this, you know? And I'm like, wait, what did you touch? Like, so, so I think that that's really encouraging too, to see, um, you know, not only the kind of like the, you know, I would say like the blue collar kids, like the shop class kids, like that you would, that you would put in that normal box you know, going into that industry, but like the science and math and technology kids, uh, coming into that space, like, you know, Hey, I don't know that I necessarily want to go to college and go spend a bunch of money on getting a degree, but like, I have an interest in robotics or I have an interest in automation or anything like that. There's a lot of need for, uh, for people in that space. I mean, save your money, like, go make some money. Um, you can always go to school and, and go get more specialized education, um, in the future. And I will say, I mean, as I get older, it's a lot easier for me to go learn something or go take a class when it's something that you want to do. 
uh, rather than just being like, all right, why am I sitting here in this class taking this stupid, you know, why do I need to know about this when it doesn't necessarily apply to what I need to do? Yeah, exactly. And then, that, and then you you got into running heavy equipment too, little later on down the road. Kind of explain how, how you got into doing that. I did, yeah. Yeah, so um, when I was growing up, my dad did uh, like uh, construction cleanup in the Carolinas, like back when uh, subdivisions were being built. So he would like clean up construction sites. So he'd always have like skid steer loaders and dump truck, you know, dump trucks around. And uh, so I kind of grew up, I mean, kind of like adjacent to heavy equipment, like a little bit. And you know, anytime I was driving down the road in the car, I'd be like looking out the window at all the, you know, excavators and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, man, I would love to run one. And any chance that I got to run one, I would. And uh, three years ago, I went to Con Expo, the big construction expo in Vegas, which is uh, actually next week. And I, you know, I was like, I can't be a spectator anymore. I can't just... I can't just watch people run equipment. Like I need to figure this out. Uh, so I bought an excavator of my own um, and a skid steer loader and a tractor and um, started learning on my own and, and just spending time. Like uh, I just hit over uh, almost 500 hours on my excavator since I bought it a couple of years ago. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm an operator for uh, for two local excavation companies. So I'll either run my equipment on, um, I bought a small one so that I can run it around the yard. We have an acre here at the house. Um, but, you know, the skills and the, the, you know, the input, you know, and the controls and stuff is exactly the same on a larger machine. So uh, my buddy has like four or five excavators um, and then a, another heavy equipment contractor that he works with has a few of them as well and dozers. And so, um, if I have like a, let's say if I have a customer that cancels on me and I've booked out like, let's say a week's worth of work out of town, like let's say I'm supposed to be in Seattle for a week and the customer like on Tuesday or whatever, like the day before is like, Hey, uh, you know, w we had something come up. We can't have you, you know, do this. I'll fill in my schedule as much as I possibly can, but like there's still, you know, sometimes I just have like a free Wednesday randomly. So I'll call up Jesse or um, uh, Ron or whatever and be like, Hey dude, you need somebody just run equipment for the day and I'll go sit in an excavator or skid steer loader or whatever. And just go get, you know, go get paid as an operator. And it's like, uh, it's like my little vacation. <laughs> I, I really like, it's something that I wish that I, that my only regret is that I didn't do it sooner, but, um, yeah, being able to get paid as a professional welder and, you know, like that's afforded me the opportunity to be able to buy a piece of equipment of my own. And had I not, you know, worked my way up in my career, like buying an excavator would just be like completely out of the question. Um, so the perfect segue because I wanted to ask you, so what, obviously, the elephant in the room, the important questions, especially with the younger generation, which my generation, I am I just turned 26, but it's like, what kind of money can I make doing it? You know what I mean? What, what kind of money can you expect? Yeah. Um, so I will say, so I'll say, I won't say specifically what I make, but I will say that a lot of people like will say, oh, you could make $100,000 a year in the welding industry. Absolutely, 100%, you definitely can. But going to work in a weld shop down the street from your house where you work 40 hours a week and you're home every night, there ain't no way you're going to make 100 grand a year. You'll maybe make 50, 60, maybe. Um, how I got to six figures and you know beyond um, I mean, I don't think I made a hundred grand until, um, you know, it was probably maybe five or 10 years ago. You know, I was in my late twenties before I cleared the hundred thousand mark. Um, but that's working multiple jobs. I was working, um, you know, I had a salaried full-time job, uh, you know, and then I was working on the side as well. Um, and, and working a lot. So, I mean, we're talking 50, 60 hours a week to break the hundred thousand mark i mean and you know that's not for everybody uh i try to be home every night 
uh, being willing to travel and being willing to move around to go get those jobs that pay more. Um, you got to be willing to do that. And, yeah. you know, you, I think that's yeah. like with any, any job. I mean, I don't think that it's fair for everybody to say that, oh, you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year as a welder. Like I, I don't necessarily, I don't disagree with that, but people's perception of what that means is like, I'm going to become a welder. I had, I'm going to go out and make a hundred thousand. It's like, it's just, you, you could, uh, and you could your first year, if you really hustled and you traveled and you, you know, work 60, 80, hundred hours a week. Sure. You could clear the hundred thousand, but you're not going to be home. You're not going to have time for a wife or girlfriend or kids or, uh, your dog or anything like that. And, and it's, I mean, I, I didn't get into the welding industry to make money. Um, but it, you know, it's certainly like as, as your career builds and as you build those core group of skills and as you kind of start to, to like you, as you learn more, the, the better educated that, that you are, the more you can kind of like leverage your education and your experience for more money. Um, and then the more opportunities that you see, they're like, Hey, this would be a really good project for me to work on. And I'll make like, let's say like $5,000 if I go away for a week to go work on this project or something or 10 grand or whatever. And those little projects are what adds up to kind of building out your salary. Um, I keep my, you know, income pretty diverse. Like I, I, I do consulting privately. Um, I always, always have a full-time job with benefits and insurance and all that stuff so that, you know, my bills and all my bases are always covered. And I... I live within the means of, of that one particular job. What I do for my own business and my consulting and heavy equipment work I do on the side, that to me is all just like, I don't know, I want to say, I don't want to say it's extra money because I really invest that in like either building things for the house or buying excavators or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, I mean, earning potential is really what you want to make it. And it's, it, it's, I think it's probably best tied to education, um, and, and experience in the, in the industry, I would say, um, just starting out like, yeah, you can do well, you're not going to make very much an hour, but if you put the hours in, then you can make some money in time. If you put years of experience in your, your salary, your wages and stuff like that are going to kind of start to go up and you're going to understand like what levers to pull when you apply for a job to be able to get like a little bit more or um, you know how to have those conversations with business owners or managers about like, Hey, I, I'm a here, I'm making 26. How do I get to 36? What does that look like? Um, but uh, again, yeah, that comes with experience and time. Thing about uh, just reaching out and, and doing podcasts and, and then learning about other trades. I mean, sure. I'm, I'm very familiar with the lineman trade and I'm, I'm a couple other trades, not, you know, like super familiar, but like, this is all learning curve for me. Do I know about the willing industry? Yeah, I know about it, but do I know about it? Like, no, a lot of things you've said, it's kind of been like, Oh, I had no idea. I mean, and I work in the trades, like I'm, I'm around it enough, but even still, like there's so many opportunities out there that like what need to help. I, that's what I'm trying to do is wanting to help expose those and then being able to, you know, teach those to other people. So okay, what outside of work, you know, what, what kind of things you like doing? You know, mentioned that you, uh, you, you do photography, you just got into doing videography and then dinking around with cars, uh, audio too. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, like cars, like I, I, I probably a huge portion, I would say, I don't know, probably 80% of my job is driving. So, I mean, you know, the Pacific Northwest, like, the best, most amazing roads, but also the craziest weather. Just like, it's just a, it's just insane. So um, for my job at Central, I mean, I cover Washington and Oregon. So I mean, all the way down to Southern Oregon, like Medford, Grants Pass, all the way up to Bellingham. So, and everywhere in between, you know, Eastern Oregon, Eastern Oregon, Western Oregon, like we have customers that, that are building stuff all over the place. And as, as my job to, uh, to go out and solve these problems, like I drive a ton. So I love modifying and building and uh, buying vehicles and stuff like that. So I have a, I have a, let's see, I have four vehicles now. So I have a, 
a Volkswagen that I bought brand new that's all built up. Um, we're getting ready to all-wheel drive swap that. Um, I have a, a, a F550 that's like my welding truck that's all kitted up. So um, I love love the rig, the rig truck. Those are cool. I, the, I love seeing them. There, there's a lot of that going on down here. There's They're building pipeline and stuff in this big, huge chip center down here in North Phoenix. There's so many of them rigs just ripping around, just welding stuff. Well, that's the in, that Intel place in, in North Phoenix. So funny story about that. One of the dudes that's a welder on that job calls me up, um, you know, send me a message on Instagram and is like, hey, dude, I need this really weird specialty welding wire and we can't get it. And the I reached out to, you know, the local welding supply place here and they just don't have it. He's like, is this something that you got you have or whatever and, and that you can help me get like it's an emergency uh, like repair and we need this right away. And, uh, me and the team at central welding and my friend, uh, Casey over at Lincoln, we located a bunch of spools of it in a warehouse in California in LA. And we actually sold it through central welding next day, aired him these spools of wire to go weld on that project. So he did all the qualifications, got everything that he needed. And he actually just sent me some photos of him welding up project or welding up stuff on that project. So it's really cool, like what what we get to to touch, you know, uh, in the industry. I mean, it's like we're a million miles away from each other, but like there's welding wire that I had a hand in helping get that's going in to finish this project. So it's it's really cool. I mean, um, but uh, oh yeah, we got off on a tangent. We we're talking about cars. Yeah, so I drive all the time. Yeah, I that, drive all the time. That's a huge change right there. Dude, I'm a big yeah. car guy, so yeah. I just bought a Porsche. Uh, I've seen that dude, and I'm a I big did, did. Porsche fan. Yeah, I uh, a Porsche. Like, dude, what are the chances? See, this is what I love to talk about right here. The fact yeah. that you bought a Porsche. It's a 911. Tur- it's not. Is it 911? It's a Turbo S. Yeah, it's, it's a 911 Turbo S. S. Yep. Which is an incredible car. I mean, Thank you. all wheel drive. Yeah. All wheel drive. Wow. PDK, yep. Uh, it's a PDK, it's a, which is massive. Uh, yeah, it's a 2012, so it's a 997.2. So it's the last of the 997 generation. 997 started in 2005, which is a year I graduated high school. So like at that time, you know, when I'm like, you know, you're a high school student, you're like dreaming of cars and stuff, watching shows like Top Gear and the oh. 997 like i literally i'm not even kidding i literally have goosebumps just thinking about like it, it's it's been something that i've really like dreamt about for a long time and uh i you know with the consulting stuff and and everything like i finally got to a point where i'm like hey i can actually really make this happen and Where did I go? There we go. All right, I'm back. Sorry, my phone rang. Um, so yeah, I got um, yeah. I mean, I just I started doing a ton of research on the cars, the nine nine seven generation. Um, I originally wanted a, a GT three, but out here in the Pacific Northwest, trying to drive a rear wheel drive only stick shift <laughs> yeah, traffic, fun, you know, like. So I ended up, I ended up like looking at turbos and then I was like, man, they have a turbo S model, like top trim, top thing. So I got it. Yeah. It's a Carrera white with a tan interior. It only had 32,000 miles on it. Um, and, uh, I bought it like, let's see, two weeks ago and I put almost 1500 miles on it <laughs> in a couple of weeks Dude. and it's been snowing here. So yeah. I'm driving it to con expo next week. I'm driving it all the way to Vegas from, from up here. The f- which route are you going? Are you going down? I'm going to go route? through California. Okay. There's yeah. a route. So, um, yeah, we can get off a tangent, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, same, similar story. Uh, I was apprentice lineman. I was making stupid good money. And there was this car I've wanted for a long time. Well, Ford came out with the Shelby, you know what? In the late 60s, they had GT350. And then they come off yep. in 2015 and stopped producing them in 2020. When they yeah. came out in, 2020, in 2015, I was like, I want that car. I yeah. want that car. I love that car. The whole, everything about it, the 5.2 liter, flat plane crank V8, red lines at 8,300 RPMs. Yeah. 530, like I just loved it. The car was awesome. I was like, I want one so bad. And then, yeah, in 2019, I was just like, I had a bunch of money, whatever. And uh, 
I was scrolling and the one popped up in Hillsboro at the at a dealership. And it's so was, funny. I bought one in 2014. I bought a 5.0, a black one, five then, liter one. I, yeah, I saw in it in Hillsboro. I was like, I'm gonna go look at this. And sure as heck, when I went down there and looked at it, I was like, "Can I take it for a test drive?" And he's like, "He kind of he's kind of looking at me, kind of weird." Obviously, I'm at that yeah. point. I was 22, 22 years old. Yeah, and of course he's looking at me like, uh, mm, yeah, "Can you sure. afford this?" Yeah, like, yeah, sure. So I, and as soon as I we took it around the block, whatever, and I got it back to the dealership, I was like, "Yeah, I want this car. This car is awesome." So, so you bought it. it. Nice. Right. You still have it. Oh yeah, of course, dude. Yes, that's awesome. So you have yeah. a, you have the you have the GT three fifty. Yeah, that's a good one, dude. Yeah, I bought a two thousand fourteen five liter GT Premium, um, and I drove that for a while. I put a bunch of the Roush stuff on it, um, and yeah, that was a cool car. Um, I actually traded it in on my Volkswagen because I've always had this love for Volkswagen. Yeah, and I bought the Jetta basically to to build like the ultimate daily slash sleeper like um that's why we're gonna all-wheel drive swap it and stuff i don't know i just i like car guys like working on cars like riding around like i just spend so much time in them i'm like i don't want to drive something boring like i just can't can't drive something boring yeah you'll have to send me a photo of this thing that's uh that's a sweet that's a good one to get dude that's a good one to get yeah yeah we go off a tangent on that for for a long time so but that's cool. Like, I think it's, I think that's, it says a lot though yeah. about being in the trades and stuff. It's like, yeah. you know, you're 22 years old and you bought this super badass car. Um, I'm not, you know, I was in my twenties when I bought my first, first, my, I bought the Mustang in my, in my twenties. Yeah. Um, you know, I bought a Porsche when I was 35. Dude, um, and it's like, you could like, this is all doable. And like, I, I felt really weird talking about the Porsche or even posting about it. Um, and one of my, uh, mentors, you know, she told me, she's like, you gotta own this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's just as, you know, I'm like, I just don't want to be looked at as like, oh, he's got a Porsche now. And it's like, cause I'm not a fancy dude. Like I literally went to work in it today, wearing what I, I just came from work Mm -hmm. and I drove it to go inspect welds at a customer that, uh, we're doing procedure development for. So, um, you know, I think that just showing people that it is attainable, I'm just an idiot high school, barely passed, like barely made it through. And if I can do it, like for sure, other people can do it. You know, you just got to work hard, you know? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that's kind of the point I wanted to want to make with that is that, I mean, a lot of things are easily attainable by yeah, no college degree, no debt. I mean, um, like it's, People, yeah, make that. People make that. And don't see that it's possible, but it, it is. I mean, yeah. Look, I mean, there's many people out there. I mean, granted, a lot of linemen, a lot of guys in the trades, they like trucks more than they like cars, so they have yeah. a hundred thousand dollar plus truck instead yeah. of a hundred thousand dollar car. Yeah, but, I mean, like they have a stinking sweet truck. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. That was always like that was... wheels and tires lifted, like sweet. And then they have they're pulling a hundred thousand dollar trailer with them too. Mm-hmm. Like, it isn't, yeah, it isn't oh, hard right. to spend uh spend a couple hundred thousand on vehicles and and it's like you don't even really realize it like when you're in the middle of it i mean you make good money in the mm-hmm. trades like i will i i will really you know like i'm a i'm living proof to that you know uh it's not all about the money but like i said like if you're passionate about what you do and you enjoy what you do going to work 60 or 80 hours a week because you're having fun 60 or 80 hours a week. It's like, you don't even really think about it. You're just getting up and going to work and having a good time. And then like, you're like, Oh, I got paid again. I'll get paid again. I get paid again. I got paid from this job. I get paid from that job. And it's like that adds up and you buy a house or a car or another car or, you know, it's, and, and you just keep working mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's fun. Yeah. Like I have a good time. Like I don't know if you could tell, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> no, yeah. Definitely no, I, having fun. Yeah. So where can uh any of these viewers, where can they find you if you have uh, uh yeah, I would say probably the easiest one. Um basically weld scientist on any platform. So um if you go like YouTube uh forward slash uh weld scientist um or weld science. Um, on Instagram, I'm at weld scientist. If anybody, and I say this to everybody and I mean it so far, I have like just under 30,000 followers. 
I have answered everyone's message. I get back to everyone that sends me a message, no matter if you have two followers or 200,000. Um, I really think that it's important that to, to be accessible to people. If you have questions, please reach out. And I do mean it. Um, there's a call button on my Instagram. You can call my cell phone and uh, I'll probably answer it. Um, and if I don't know your number, leave me a voicemail and I'll call you back or shoot me a text or whatever. Um, but Instagram is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me um, at Weld Scientist. Uh, LinkedIn, Nate Bowman on LinkedIn. Um, YouTube at Weld Scientist. A uh, bunch of YouTube videos up there um, about the industry and uh, technical welding stuff. But yeah, pretty accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to definitely will link those in the description of the, when I put this on YouTube for sure, because that's, that's really good to know, you know, if someone does watch this and they're, they're yeah. granted they're interested in the welding industry or a career in it. I mean, if you're that accessible and in, in you're yeah. like, that's extremely helpful for those. Yeah. Kinds try of me because. seriously, pick up your phone and try and call me and see if I answer, like prove me wrong. Because like, so like I said, so far, with 30,000 followers, I've responded to every single person's comment and answered people's questions. And I think that that's a really important thing that uh, people that have been in the industry for a while need to do is they need to close that loop. Don't make it, don't roadblock people, hmm. like welcome them into the industry, help them make it more accessible, give them the encouragement that they need to go to that shop down the street. Like I say that, I believe it and I mean it, like mm -hmm. reach out, I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll answer, I'll talk to you. Yeah. All right. Chances Nate. are I'm just going to be driving, you know, so like I can just put my AirPods in and talk to you Absolutely. for hours. So, yeah. well, cool, dude. I, uh, I'll let you, uh, go and so yeah. much for 30 minutes, hey, <laughs> but it, hey, it was cool. it is. you have to provide some very valuable information. So, um, sure. Thanks Nate for coming on and, and teaching what you know and helping spread some knowledge about the welding industry. And hopefully anyone that watches this, you know, will gain a couple of things and, can pursue something in the welding industry and they know where to find you. They know where to find me and I know where to find you because yeah. I mean, I have your number. So yeah, reach like, out. Like you said, reach out, reach out to me. If I don't, that's the thing is if someone reaches out to me via blueprint and they're like, Hey Austin, like uh, I'm interested in this, like becoming a GPS tech in the dirt world. Like I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to find somebody that does know about it and I'm yeah. going to help you. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't know I think it's, welding, but I know yeah. Nate and Nate knows a lot of stuff about the welding industry. So, yep. you know, the whole networking and having connections and knowing people is very important. So same view. I mean, if someone were to come to you and be like, Hey, like I want to yeah. get an alignment trade. Yeah. You're like, well, I don't really know any alignment, but I do know Austin else. and he, yeah. he knows all about that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We got to right. do our part, you know, got to do our part to help people in, you know, so come on over. Yeah, sounds good, Nate. Well, thank you. Appreciate cool. it. Yeah, thanks. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode with Nate. Nate's a very talented and knowledgeable individual, especially in the welding industry. He has a bunch of time and experience, and he knows what he's talking about. So hopefully you learned something from this episode. And like Nate said, if you have any questions, you can find him on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Reach out. If you have questions, you want to get started in the welding industry, Reach out to me. I'll try to help. Reach out to Nate. You heard him in the podcast. He said, give him a call. He'll probably answer. So don't be hesitant. Don't be scared. If it's something you want to try, you just got to hop in and do it. Thank you for watching. See you next time.